And we saw that also in verse 16. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. That's what they expected to receive when they died. And that is what they did receive when they died. God did not mock them with empty promises. You can see that, for example, in Psalm 73. Here's Asaph in the Old Testament confessing his hope in the afterlife. Thou shalt guide me, verse 24, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom am I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. And Psalm 17, verse 15, Psalm 17, verse 15, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. But for all that the Old Testament saints enjoyed through faith, none of them received the promise. That's the force of the grammar of our text. Although, and these all, although they obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Despite God's approval of them, despite God's provision for them, despite God's preservation of them through many dangers and trials and difficulties, Despite God enabling them to do great works, great exploits through faith, they did not receive the promise. They never received the promise. In the Old Testament, Christ was promised, but Christ did not yet come. And therefore, they had close fellowship with God but not as close as they desired. They longed to have a sweeter and better and richer fellowship with God. They did not live to see the coming of the Messiah. They did not live to see and know the death and resurrection of the Savior whom God would send. They knew that God would send the Savior, they had some idea of who he would be like and what he would do, but they never had that complete understanding of Christ which they longed for. And they couldn't, because they did not have the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And therefore they could not have that greater knowledge which that outpouring would give to the church and they could not see and know the New Testament church and all of the blessings which the New Testament church enjoys they did not see the gathering of the Gentiles into the New Testament church all of these things were promised in the Old Testament and they were made known to them in a, in a shadowy indistinct way and not having the fullness of the spirit they could not fully understand it think of a shadow why is there a shadow because there is a reality behind the shadow casting the shadow and the saints live in the days of shadows they saw the sacrifices they had the priesthood, they had the tabernacle, they had the land of Canaan, all of these were pictures. They had the feast days, the ordinances, the washings, and so on. And they knew all of these are shadows. 
There must be something back there casting the shadow. And that something is what God has promised. We wish we could get behind there and see what's casting the shadow. We have the shadow, and the shadow is wonderful in many ways, but if only we could get behind and see what is casting the shadow. As it were, they wanted to get behind the curtain and get into the presence of God, but they never could because they lived in the time of shadows. And simply with those shadows, and clinging to Christ who was casting those shadows, they believed. And they were prepared to suffer great things and to do great feats for God. And how thrilled, just imagine how thrilled they would have been if they had been privileged to live in the time of the New Testament age. And had seen the fullness of salvation which came through Jesus Christ. Christ himself speaks of that in Matthew 13. speaking to his disciples. Matthew 13, 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them. And to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Elijah was here. Or King David. How amazed he would be to see the privileges that we have in the New Testament church. First Peter is similar. First Peter 1, 10 to 12. And here Peter is talking about the Old Testament prophets who wrote about the coming of Jesus Christ. Of which salvation the prophets had inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. As it were, Isaiah the prophet is writing chapter 53 about the sufferings of Jesus Christ and the glory that shall follow. And he's trying his hardest to understand what exactly these things mean and when these things will come to pass and if only he could live to see it. And yet, Isaiah the prophet, a godly man, lived by faith, and he did not receive the promise. Peter says he was ready not for his own, but for us, for the salvation which would come to us. But there's more to the promise than the coming of Christ and the New Testament age. The promise includes the saints being perfected on the last day. Verse 40, that they without us should not be made Perfect. Made perfect. In other words, this promise includes the first and the second comings of Christ. The Old Testament saints did not live to see the first coming, and they are still waiting for the second coming, because only at the second coming will they be made perfect. That will be the time when they are glorified, body and soul. They will be perfect, complete. They will come to their final goal, and that goal is to be purified of all sin 
to live with God and enjoy his covenant blessings in body and soul forever. And that is future for the Old Testament saints just as it is future for us. And the Old Testament saints have achieved the first stage of that perfection. They are perfect in their soul. Hebrews 12, 23, the next chapter tells us of some spirits of just men made perfect. That's the Old Testament believers. They are the spirits of just men made perfect. So Abel and Job and Enoch and Abraham and all the tortured and slain saints of the previous verses all of them are righteous before God, perfect in their soul, and perfectly free from sin. But they cannot have their perfect resurrection bodies until first Christ comes and purchases for them the right to have such perfection, and second, until Christ comes again on the last day to raise them bodily from the dead. And until then, Job has to wait. Remember, Job said, In my flesh I shall see God. He will not see God in his flesh until the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's been delayed. It's been delayed for a purpose. Not God's unfaithfulness, that's impossible. Not the saints' failure to fulfill conditions, there are no conditions, but verse 40 tells us that God has provided something better for us. That's the reason for the delay. God having provided something better for us. And that word better is a common word in the book of Hebrews. It refers to the salvation of the New Testament church. That's the theme of the book of Hebrews. The superiority of New Testament salvation in Jesus Christ over the Old Testament. The superiority of Jesus Christ over Moses and the law and the shadows. Christianity's superiority over Judaism. And again and again, Hebrews tells us that. In Hebrews, we read that Christ is better than the angels. Chapter 1, verse 4. That Christ is worthy of more glory than Moses. Chapter 3, verse 3. That Christ is better than Abraham. Chapter 7, verse 7. That Christ is the mediator of a better testament. Chapter 7, verse 22 that Christ has a more excellent ministry and serves a better covenant established upon better promises, chapter 8, verse 6. That Christ has offered a better sacrifice, chapter 9, verse 23, and that the blood of Christ speaks better things than that of Abel, chapter 12, verse 24. The Old Testament saints had something good. Indeed, they have something excellent, something blessed. But the coming of Christ and the New Testament age bring something better. And what's better in the New Testament age? We have a better and clearer knowledge of Christ. We have closer and sweeter fellowship with God. We have a richer experience of grace. We have a better and more developed understanding of the whole plan of salvation. We have freer access to God than the Old Testament saints have. No more priests, no more curtain between the holy and the holy of holies. No more sacrifices, no more washing yourself with water to enter into the presence of God. We have a greater, richer access into God's presence.